Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 68, The Path to Mastery, Tips for Becoming a Solid GM. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone to Twitch here in the lobby. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Uh, tonight, we've got an RPG topic. We haven't had one of those in a little while. Uh, Brent is looking for some tips on how to become a solid game master as quick as possible. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look at Horrified from Ravensburger in our On the Table segment, as well as our Bellhops Tabletop segment. And there, we're also going to be sharing my initial thoughts on Pulsar 2849 from Czech Games Editions. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll uh, share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, or some gaming discussions we've been part of out on the internet. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, so... If you want to say something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right, up first, a comment left on an Instagram picture of Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, which I've gotten a lot of plays in with uh, Halloween coming up. I brought it out to a bunch of spooky game nights and it got played at a lot of those. I totally forgot the comment. It's gone. <laughs> Wasn't it there before? It was, it was because I, res I I put my response into or no, you put your response into it, so I skipped it. Uh, uh, okay. Now, while that's happening, we're going to go uh, skip over to a comment by Gene Chu, <laughs> who had this to <laughs> say about last week's topic of good licensed games. One of the uh, one on their list, I would say BSG, Battlestar Galactica, and Horrified is really good. I'm not impressed with Legendary Middle Earth The Wizard as an interesting choice. I bought the game when it first came out, but the rulebook was horrible, and I never got to play it much. Several years ago, I got a hold of some more cards, pre-constructed decks, and a better rulebook. I found the deck building aspect to be limited, but it may be due to my limited card pool. I felt like the deck build itself didn't have enough meaningful choices. My favorite game that had a license is Tyrants of the Underdark. It has the D&D license, but it's a very good game regardless of the license or setting. The licensed components reflected the D&D theme and world quite well for me. Well, thanks for the comment, Gene. I, I strongly considered putting Tyrants of the Underdark on the list and talking about it on the show. And the only reason I didn't is because it's the D&D license. And we were already talking about tabletop games. And to me, d and is a tabletop game. And I mainly wanted to talk about games based on existing properties or media licenses, like bigger names than D&D. So I did skip that one. But I do definitely dig Tyrants of the Underdark. Now, regarding Middle Earth the Wizards, Deanna and I had a ton of cards. Uh, that was mainly due for the fact that the Meyer, just across the border here from Windsor, had wax boxes for 10 bucks each. Those are like 36 booster packs in each box over in Meyer. So we had a ton of cards to choose from. And I do think it was probably the limited card pool that diminished your enjoyment of it, which, you know what, the limited card pool is pretty much the problem with any CCG if you're not keeping up with everything that comes out or if you don't have the money to keep up with it. Now, Keith's comment has vanished into the ether, but all it was was he said, gotta admit, this is a great kids game I picked up based on listening to your podcast. Yeah, no, and thanks, Keith. We can't really can't recommend Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters enough. It's not often that you get a game that's great for kids and also fun for adults with or without the kids present. Now, Phil left a comment on the blog. Uh, this was also about our licensed game discussion from last week. I think a good licensed game is one that makes you feel as though you are in the setting you're familiar with, captures the feeling and a sense of immersion into the setting. Legendary Encounters Alien is a good example of a game that does that. Another is Big Trouble in Little China the Game. I feel like I'm in the movie when I play that game. I also agree with Star Wars Rebellion and Star Trek Ascendancy. Both do an excellent job of capturing the feel of the setting and movies that they're based on. Well, thanks, Phil. I know in my play of Big Trouble in Little China, I didn't play enough like I was in the movie. And that was part of the reason, I think, why we failed. Uh, looking back on that play, I realized that I had really been trying to sort of gamer it more, more rather than play the, 
play play a character in the movie uh and so i took chances that the characters in the movie never would have and it led to some poor uh, poor results yeah we should have ran away more was, yes, what, was, was the main thing absolutely. there's a lot of running in that movie uh, finally, I want to thank Jeremy Frostoff Smith for featuring the Tabletop Bellhop blog on his Thought Eater podcast today. Thanks for including us on your Hump Day blogorama yet again, Jeremy. That's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around after the double bell as we continue the show. So tonight we've been uh, having some chats about coffee and advertising, uh, as we have started doing a little bit of advertising uh, before and in the middle portion of our live stream in order to uh, try and help fund the cause. Uh, yeah, plus also like I said it stops it. So on Twitch, if you don't watch on Twitch, you wouldn't know this, but generally when you join a channel and go to watch and you're all excited to watch something it puts up a stupid ad, right? Like as soon as you load the channel, and for a lot of podcasts that record live and a lot of shows that record live, they like to start prompt, right? So if they say the show starts at nine, they start the show at nine, which is a problem because people joining right at nine often get have to watch an ad before getting into the show. So for one thing, that's why we don't start right away and we do a little bit of pre-show banter before we start recording to get time for people to do that. But it's also another reason to run ads during the show because by doing that, new people who come in aren't hit with that ad wall as soon as they show up. Yeah, it's tough sometimes uh, with a broadcaster like us who's not doing uh, a known game, whereas you see the thumbnail and you say, oh, look, that person's playing Fortnite. Uh, I want to see what they're doing. No, we're doing something a little different on Twitch. And so people are, are hesitant to wait through an ad to see content they aren't familiar with. Yeah. Uh, so this helps uh, lower the entry bar for uh, new viewers. All right. And uh, so this week we're going to be talking about GMing. This yep. is a, a stretch for us, but uh, <laughs> something something close to uh, the hearts of many of our chat room listeners. So hopefully you'll jump in and uh, take part in the chat and we'll uh, hop back into the lobby again after the Ask the Bell Hop, uh, if not during, to get your thoughts, thoughts and comments about new GMs. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. As social media works too, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get lost. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we're going to remind everyone that Tabletop doesn't just mean board games to us with an RPG topic. Today's question comes from Brent, McBri uh, Bent Mc Brent McBride, the owner of Hidden Trail Escape Rooms down in Windsor. Brent asks, I have almost no experience in playing D&D or any role-playing games, but I think I would have a blast being a DM eventually. What's the fastest path to being a solid GM? DM? Well, thanks for the question, Brent. Uh, one quick thing, we're going to swap between DM, GM, Master of Ceremony, whatever term, the person who facilitates the game. Also, I want to really thank Brent and Hidden Trail Escape Rooms for stepping up and helping us out here in Windsor for our 2019 Extra Life efforts. Brent personally took over running our escape room, as well as donating an eight-person escape room experience to our live auction. Brent's been supporting us since he first opened Hidden Trail, and it's greatly appreciated. Indeed. Thank you, Brent. Now, ever since the Bellhop team attended BreakoutCon 2019, there's a certain phrase we keep repeating, and we keep repeating it multiple episodes. Uh, the first time we heard it was at Breakout, and that is fail faster. Now, while the panel we first heard it on, and the context most of the time is going to be in regards to game design, I think it really applies here as well. Because the fastest and best path to becoming a better GM, DM, Master of Ceremonies, Hollyhock God, or whatever you want to call the person sitting at, at the, the head of the table, the best way is to actually get behind the screen, get to the table and do it. The sooner you run your first game and the sooner you start learning what you did right and what you did wrong, the better. You will only learn to run a game by running it. You can read all the rule books, memorize them if that's your thing, but that doesn't mean you're ready. To me, in many ways, running an RPG is like getting into a fight. 
You just don't know how you're going to react until someone throws that first punch or that first die. So don't be as adversarial as you might be <laughs> while in a fight. But honestly, the more games you run, the more often, the better you're going to get. Facilitating an RPG session is a skill. And like any skill, it's going to get better with practice. And one of the only ways it's going to get better is with practice. Since running games is a social thing, the best way to get that practice in is to actually sit down and run games for other people. Don't put it off. Don't wait for some magical place in your life where you're going to feel ready. Now I'm ready to DM. Now I'm fully prepared. Trust me, I have been running games for many, many years, and you never hit that place where you're 100% ready and 100% ready and confident in your skills. And just, I'm the best DM. I'm ready to go. It's never going to happen. You're always going to be second-guessing yourself, always going to be worrying. Now, there are some things you can do away from the table to better prepare for running a table and running a game. And we'll get to some of those in a moment. But you don't need to do any of that before you start. Nothing is going to teach you better than actual playtime. Yep. You want to learn what works and what doesn't, and then forget all of that because you're in front of a different group that behaves differently than your other group. <laughs> yes, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, you're going to waste time on things you probably shouldn't waste time on. You're going to have to look up things in the books or on the PDF or Google something. You're going to make the wrong call. You're probably going to fail to share the spotlight equally. You're going to highlight the wrong player. You might send someone down a dead-end path. The players are going to do things you'll never expect. Now, this is another thing you're going to have to trust me on. This is every game you'll ever run your entire life. That never changes. It's not going to be perfect. It may not even be pretty. Just don't expect things to be awesome the first time. Now, one thing I think can get easily lost is that to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the game, the GM is some combination of author, god, computer, and guide. The particular game system you've chosen will impact that balance to a large degree. Uh, without a GM there, players are basically running around with their fingers for guns saying, <laughs> I hit you, no, I hit you, no, I hit you. And it, just as we did as young children. And it's the GMs who takes the actions and the ideas of the players and rolls that into a cohesive story based either in a commercial adventure you've purchased or something that you've created yourself from scratch or any combination in between. Now, one of the things that's important when just starting out is make sure you disclose, make sure you're obvious, talk about it. Let the table know that you're new to this. Be honest. Disclose your lack of experience. Warn players that you're probably going to make mistakes. I have met very few players over the years who are not going to be cool with this. And if there is one who's not going to be cool with this, you probably don't want to game with them anyway. The fact you're hosting a game for the players isn't going to be lost on them. You're basically there to entertain them, to give them an experience and help facilitate their fun. People are going to appreciate that gesture alone, and more people are going to be willing to forgive not only a few simple mistakes, but big glaring ones as well, because you're there for them. The key, as always, for this is to manage expectations. Yes. Expectation setting should be done in what we call session zero. We've talked about this on the show almost every time we talk about an RPG topic, session zero comes up. This is your first meeting of the group before the first actual game. It could happen the same session. It doesn't have to be like a special day you do it. We've talked about session zero before, but the main point of session zero without doing a whole episode on it is to get everyone on the same page before you start making sure everyone's expectations match and everyone knows what they're going to be getting out of the night. This is where you're going to introduce your level of skill and comfort at the table. This is something that should and can be discussed along with everything else like safety tools and things like cats and other things we brought up beforehand. It's worth noting that with an inexperienced GM, the chances are higher that things might drift off track and go somewhere uncomfortable as well safety tool initiated from the very start of your career sets a strong tone of openness and acceptance because people, they know from the beginning that they have the power to say stop. Yeah, and if you don't know what we mean by safety tools, please Google it, please look it up. Again, that's a bigger topic than this particular episode, but it's something that makes the table more inviting and approachable to more players. It is a good thing. We strongly, both of us, everyone I think that listens to this show, everyone in the chat room strongly agrees this is... It is the way games have changed in a positive way to allow for more people to have more fun playing. Now, this leads to my first tip that isn't just sit down and play, play a game. 
when you are first starting off, you want to try to find the right group to play with. Now, in many cases, this is probably going to be family and friends, people who trust you and who you trust, people who are going to be patient enough to put up with the learning curve. Not only are the players hopefully going to be more forgiving, you're going to be more comfortable running with them. This is a great option to grow with a group. If you can start with players who are new, you're going to be all in the same spot when it comes to learning, and you'll work through things together. Now, some of us are lucky enough to have an existing group already. This is a fantastic place to start. If you're already in a group playing a game as a player, you've already got people there who know you and know what to expect from you, and you know them. If you're interested in running a game, mention it to the group before or after one of your regular sessions. There aren't many GMs out there that aren't going to jump at the chance to have another GM in the group to share the workload and to give each other a break from now and then. I feel like this is a dig at the fact that you were always the DM for us. <laughs> no, I, I, I have no regrets. I have no regrets. As long as I got to play now and then. That's why we used to split up our sessions at the university. I played in someone else's game. It wasn't with the same group of people, but I at least still got a chance to play. Now, if you don't have uh, friends and family to play with or your friends and family aren't interested and you don't have a group, uh, don't panic. Running for strangers really isn't that bad. As mentioned above, you're doing something for these people. You are providing a form of entertainment to them, and they're going to appreciate it. At least, like I said, 99%, most people. And if the people don't, those aren't people you want to game with. Now, trying to find a group is a topic for another show. I'll just reiterate here to make sure you're clear about the fact that you are new to this and ask people to be forgiving because of it. We all had to start fresh somewhere. Now, one recommendation is to check out our episode, Finding Your Yoda, where you can try and find yourself a mentor for both board games, but also for RPGs. All right, my next suggestion for the fast track to becoming a great DM is to pick the right game. Now, there's two things I think that are important to think about here when picking which game to run, and they're almost counter, like they, they come, almost go against each other, because first off, you want something you're excited about. Being excited about what you are running is honestly my number one GM tip overall. Like if you are going to run a game, be excited to run it. You are going to run a better game as an excited facilitator, and the energy you bring to the table is going to feed off to the players and get other people excited. Being it, This is enough to drive a game and make everyone completely forget that you used the wrong AC for the orc or forgot the name of an NPC or had to look something up in a book. Yeah, if you love Star Wars and both you and your friends love wrestling, don't maybe jump into playing Star Wars when you could start off with something like Worldwide Wrestling to play to all of your strengths. Then again, if you don't know your group, but you really know Star Wars, that might be your best choice to go with what you know. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part is trying to find a game that fits your skill level. Now, my immediate thought is say, find an easy to run game, find a simple game, find a game with a short rule book or with really simple rules, but that's not necessarily the right answer. It's all about your personal comfort and skill level. Easy doesn't necessarily mean better for new players. Sometimes a mathematically crunchy game with a thousand page rule book is exempt, exactly the um, the tool a new DM needs. It's, it's, it's a comfort level. It's, it's a um, safety blanket in a way because that game is going to have mechanics for everything. And the physical rules of the game are all there in place already. They're not gonna require improvising. There is an answer to all the player questions. How do I do this? Let us look it up, it's all there. Now an added bonus is that the players that like these crunchy games usually like them a lot. And they tend to come with a level of rule mastery themselves and they can help you facilitate running a game by clarifying and reminding you of rules. Because there is nothing wrong with leaning on player knowledge, especially rule knowledge, while playing a game. Then again, if you're really hoping for something more interactive and improvisational, something like a Fate or a uh, Powered by the Apocalypse game may suit your interests and flexibility better. Again, yeah. knowing what you want out of a game se out of the game session is important here. Yeah, exactly. Some new games... Some new GMs are going to feel comfortable with a stack of rule books to stand behind. Most are probably going to be more comfortable starting off with a rules light system, something without a lot of learning required before the game starts. Now, there are a ton of modern indie games out here that really shine. Like Sean said, anything Fate, Powered by the Apocalypse, Fate Core, or sorry, Fate Accelerated in particular over Fate Core 
Uh, there are one page RPGs out there like Rocker Boys and Vending Machines and Lasers and Feelings. And then card driven story games like For the Queen, you could get a group of four friends. Not that there's a DM in that game, but to get used to DMing and like you open the deck and play. There is no prep. There is no reading the rules. There's no learning to play ahead of time. You just sit down and play. In that case, the facilitator is probably the person that owns the game. Now, while rules light, some of these rely on the GM to be able to craft and move that story along. So while different, they aren't always easier depending on what your confidence level is. Yeah. Organizing that story versus controlling the rules and letting the players drive the story a little bit more. Yeah, this is why I said like there's no particularly right G, like right right rule book, right? I I like I'd love to tell everyone go buy the D&D Essentials kit, it's the perfect place. Or go buy the Tales of a Quench Equestria starter set. Or go pick up Lasers and Feelings or Love and Justice and you'll you'll have a great time. It, it's based on your own personal comfort level. Where there's where I'd also lead back on what are you more excited to run? So find something you're excited to tell a story about and find a game that can do it. Might be a good way to do it that way. Now the middle ground is kind of the the mix, right? The 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 heavy game with an intro box. This is something that was huge in the eighties. That every role playing game came in a box set, right? The D and D red box, the Marvel superheroes yellow box, the Star Trek fast. So everything was in a box. And these are kind of starting to make a comeback, which personally makes me really happy because I love these. Most major RPG publishers now put out some type of beginner box for their system. Now, D&D actually has like three. There's the, the starter set, which is out. Then they just put out this new essentials kit that was in Target for a while. And then there's the Stranger's Things starter set that's trying to get a whole new audience. Now, what these boxes do is walk your entire group, players and GM, through getting into whatever game it is one step at a time. They're written for new players and game moderators alike. And what I love to see is that the modern sets have way more advice for new game masters. And this includes things like how to find a group, what to do before the game begins, how to prep, how to schedule a game night, not just things like how to run a combat in D&D. Now, these boxes are often flexible enough that they hand feed you almost everything, but are forgiving if you want to add some of your own flair as well. Yeah, a lot of the good ones, uh, the Pathfinder beginner box is still one of my favorites, where it gives you a really simple adventure. There were four other really small adventures online, but then gave you all the tools to keep running that box up to level five. And then once you hit level five, they encourage you to buy the massive tome that is Pathfinder. Like, I find these great for intros. And I'm like, I almost wish more of the indie games had in intro boxes, but, like, they're usually small enough they don't need an intro box, but you just don't have that walkthrough. A lot of the indie games seem to assume you've already played D&D at least already or some other role-playing game, which I get because most people who find indie games have already found a mass market game first. But again, you're trying to find a game that fits your comfort level uh, skill level is a bad one to say because you might not know your skill level yet, but basically your comfort level with improvising rules, making calls on the fly, and improvising scenes. Where a intro box set is going to probably provide you all of that. It's going to provide you the scenes, it's going to provide you the math, it's going to provide you the mechanics, all right in front of you, step by step, telling you how to play through it. Now my next tip is to learn from others. One of the most eye-opening things for me growing up with RPGs was the transition from playing with my own personal friends, my cousin in particular, my own family, and then going to a public play place, which was the University of Windsor's Wayne Windsor Gaming Society, and playing under other people, playing in other people's games. Because everyone has their own unique twist on how they run games, different skills they're good at, and different ways to prevent and handle information. The more people you play under, the more you can learn. Like, even now, for years of running games, every time I play with a new GM, I see something new, something I can do better the next time I run. I would almost say it's a rule, almost. Don't run a game if you've never played a game. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean don't run D&D until you've played D&D, but if you've never sat in the chair at an RPG session and felt what it's like to be a player, it can be hard running for others who are sitting in those mm -hmm. chairs. Uh, now, with the exception, of course, being that when there's just no option. Uh, you and your probably young friends really want to play a game, but don't even know where to begin. You go out and you buy the Stranger's Thing starter box and one of you chooses to be the DM. Yeah. So nowadays, that's not like when, when in the 80s, that's how it was done. Like I learned how to DM by reading a book and doing it. That, there was no option. I didn't know there were other people who played around Windsor, right? But today you don't have to join another player's game to basically sit at the table. Every week, tomorrow night, tens of thousands of people are going to watch Matt Mercer run Dungeons & Dragons for the world on Critical Role. 
Now, along with that, there are a ridiculous number of actual play streams out there. There's probably 500 or more running right now on Twitch while we're live right now. Then there's all the videos on YouTube. And then even more so, audio podcasts, audio-only podcasts, actual plays. If you want to watch or listen to someone else GM a game and try to learn from that, they're just a click away. Now, one important thing to remember, though, some of these people, Matt Mercer in particular, and some of the other streamers are paid professionals. People whose livelihood is centered around running games. Their entire professional lives are centered on running an entertaining game for an audience, and they have the time and means to fine hone that craft. It's unlikely you can devote all your downtime to better describing a town in visual detail or spend hours practicing NPC voices in the mirror. Just realize that running a game to entertain an audience is not the same as running a game to entertain a table of players. Don't set them as a bar to hit. Yeah. I would say do not think about streaming your initial efforts. Just don't. Learn your craft before diving into the deep end of broadcasting while running a game. They are two separate uh, jobs, essentially. Now, what I would say is, if you were interested in perhaps in the future podcasting or something, record it. Put a recorder mm -hmm. at the table and have that audio stored somewhere in the background, and you maybe even go back and learn, and you can you can learn from your own playing mm -hmm. and see what happened. But don't consider releasing that sort of thing right away. Focus on the game, because if you're trying to stream and broadcast, you will be focusing on trying to streaming and stream and broadcast and not on the game in front of you. Yeah, that's a, that's another tip for again, like for any skill or acting in particular, or anything where you're presenting, watching yourself can be useful. So recording yourself and listening to it afterwards, just don't get focused on the fact you're recording. Remember you're there to entertain the other players. Now, watching people run games, either literally watching or playing as a player, is a form of research. Now, research is an important part of improving any skill. If you want to improve your skill at anything, you do some research. Now, when I say research, I think sitting down with a tome of books and reading, well, that applies to DMing as well. There are a surprising number and growing number of books being published on the topic of running role-playing games and doing a better job of it. Now, personally, I'm going to give a shout out to the books by Engine Publishing. Um, I'm a huge fan of Never Underprepared, Unframed, and Odyssey in particular, but there are others out there. And then there's the internet. There are any number of blogs, forum, podcasts, videos, and other sites dedicated to honing the craft of facilitating an RPG session. Yeah, I feel like this might not need to be said, but we're going to say it for the record anyway. As with anything on the internet, be wary of unmoderated content. Alphabeard1947 may speak a lot and very confidently, but that doesn't mean you should listen to any of what they have to say. There are still gatekeepers out there saying things like, if you've only played X, you're not a real gamer. Yeah. And this is a family podcast, so instead of what I actually feel, I will simply say <laughs> they're wrong, very wrong. All right, to bring things back to the beginning, uh, there are a lot of things out there that can make you a better game master. There's books and blogs to read, podcasts and videos to watch and listen to. Uh, you can play under a variety of different moderators or watch them on stream or and learn from what they're doing. But nothing is actually sitting down and running a game yourself. Listen to the memes. Listen to Shia LaBeouf. Just do it! But maybe not listen to him on anything else. <laughs> Now, I'm sure there's other things people can and have done to help hone their GM skills, especially as a new GM. Things to fast track their path to GM greatness. I want to know what these things are. Let us know your tips for new GMs in the comments or hit us up on social media or send me an email, mo at Tabletop Bellhop or find me on the web, Tabletop Bellhop, one word everywhere. I want to hear your tips and we'll share them in our next episode. Now let's check back into the lobby. So uh, Major Kayla has been in there. Apparently we don't have our uh, normal RPG uh, squads hang in the chat room. But uh, Major Kayla points out, uh, as a GM who only started this year's, the tips she embraced when taking the leap were, one, don't worry if you're not an expert yeah. at the rules. Uh, and if the rules are slowing down the game, hand wave them. Uh, this, and that's a really important thing. You know, as the GM... It's important to understand that you are the God. It, it is your world. And even though there is a rule in a book somewhere that tells you how to do something, you don't have to follow it. Right. Uh, it's, you know, 
you are the god and uh and and that's one of the reasons why i think i took it out of the comments my comments along the way is you kind of want to avoid rule lawyers at your first table uh <laughs> while they can be helpful helping you find rules uh again sticking to the rules religiously isn't always the best thing for a game again it, it depends in a way because there are a certain group of gamers a certain style of play that are very much mechanical almost competition style gaming if we're looking at Dungeons and Dragons Adventure League, Pathfinder, uh, organized play, organized play games, if you're going to run an organized play game, there is an expectation of rules knowledge. And there are people who love to play those games and min and max their characters and follow all the rules and do it a certain way. And part of the joy they get out of that is, especially in the organized play, is that it's a shared experience. So after playing the game, I could play in Windsor, Sean could play in Toronto, and then we can get together and talk about the adventure. And we would have had a very similar experience because the mechanics, if handled properly, would have been identical in both the games. True. So there, there is a style to play where that is encouraged. But, but I, but I think for a new DM, uh, aiming for competition level DM of D and D is probably a bit. Uh... Over. It's just a lot of GMs get in through the Adventures League nowadays because right. okay. that's where you're going to find players. Players are right. playing D&D. There, there are six tables, I think, at the FLGS now that are running, and that's where a lot of new DMs get their start nowadays. Yep. So it's just it's a matter, again, of knowing your table, knowing your players, and knowing your own skills. Uh, next My point to that is yep. rely on the players. If you're yep. playing a game like Pathfinder, and especially if you show up to like an Adventure League or Pathfinder Society game, I will almost guarantee you the other people at that table are going to know those rules without having to reference the rule book. Use them. There's and no that, reason And that not. rolls right into Mage Gilla's second point. When in doubt, ask the players to table source yes. or ask them open-ended questions. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have, if, if your players have run off into a part of the world that you hadn't scoped, hadn't scripted yet, ask them questions about things and, and use that time to scramble together a piece of story to fill it in yeah. and get them back on track or, uh, you know, help them help them fill in some blanks along the way. They're there as a resource as much as, you know, yes. part of the story. Yeah, uh, Part of the thing to remember is this is a change in mentality for gaming over the years is it used to be the players showed up and expected the DM to entertain them. And while that is still part of it, you are still a facilitator, you are the, you, you, you have a leadership role as a GM, and it is up to you to incur and make sure that everyone's having fun. It's no longer just the DM's responsibility that everyone have fun and build the story. Everyone should be working together to make an enjoyable shared experience. And that is something indie gaming, things like the Forge have driven out, and I think it's a fantastic change to the game. It's no longer the DM having to come up with everything, source the table, use the people at the table. Now, not every character is going, person is going to be comfortable making up everything, but you can still ask people. And, and that's part of it, too, is don't feel there's a wall between you and the players. You can ask, are you having fun? Am I doing this right? Do you mind if I do this? Hey, I need 15 minutes because you guys just went somewhere I wasn't expecting. Can you give me 15 minutes to flip through the book and figure out what should be next if you're running a module or to come up with something? Um, there's no shame in admitting that you're you're learning and you're new and the players, like the, most players are going to be proud of the fact they just stumped you, to be <laughs> honest. They, they tend to get pretty happy when they stump yep. the DGM. So they're going to appreciate you taking the time rather than just trying to keep the momentum, keep going and keep going and just making things up and things snowballing, yep. have that conversation. There's no reason not to stop the game and talk about it. And, uh, and then her last point uh, on, on that first post is, and now this is for people who are using their, doing their own campaigns and not uh, necessarily working out of a book, but don't over plan basic mm -hmm. plot, villain and important clues enough for an index card. The player's, won't do what you want them to do anyway. No, so, you know, your your players will just do whatever they can. I mean, one of the one of the reasons uh, video games tend to feel like they're railroading you is because the the gamer is always trying to do something else. Uh and unless it's an open world game, you know, you can only program so many yeah. variables in there. So, yeah, plan plan don't that we talked about setting expectations for the table. Set your own expectations, right? Don't, you're not telling, you're not writing a novel. You're not telling a story. You are creating a story with the players and there has to be room for that to develop. Okay. If you've got this massive plot and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and then this character is going to do this and then this, you're writing a novel. You're not writing an RPG adventure. Yep. You want to generally nowadays almost 
play to discover what happens and the fact that all you need is a starting spark, something to get things going, and the players will take it from there. Yep. You know, have some have some NPCs ready, but don't necessarily have their entire li life planned out for them because they may never get to that point where you had planned on introducing that NPC. You're going to need to walk that MP NPC in, th in through the back door or they'll never see them. Flexibility. Well, I said, the biggest thing is do it. Like seriously, yeah. get out there, play, run a game, get, go online, run it through Skype, run it on on go on Twitter, say, hey, I want to run my first game. I, I'm really nervous. Will someone play a game with me for the first time? I bet you get people jump to join. Yeah. Go to the local game store. They they probably assuming your local game store is an RPG night, ask if anyone's looking for GMs. Yeah. If you got your existing group, seriously, mention it to the DM. There are going to be some DMs out there like, no, no, it's my game. Then you might have to look for another night. Or, or maybe you ask the players, hey, you guys come over here on Wednesday. So how about you head to my place next Tuesday? Yep. We don't interrupt this game. We don't end this game, but we start something new. But just do it. Like, it, yep. it's it's not nearly as scary or as intimidating or, to be honest, as hard as some people make it out to be. Yep. Yes, it's a skill, but you're going to get better. It's It's no magical... There's no magical GM gene that some people are born with and some people aren't, and they're just naturally good at it. It doesn't exist. Yep. Uh, and Evil John in the chat room put up one of our other favorite uh, favorite sayings, as well as, uh, you know, fail fast, fail often. You can't be afraid to kill your darlings, right? Yep. If, you know, if you have gone ahead and decided to write a whole bunch of plot, that's great. You know, we're not necessarily saying don't do it, but if you have done it, be aware that you might have to just toss it, yep. right? The, the players, the players uh, to went honest, to a different city. I don't city. think it's worth the amount of prep work that most people put in, right? Like just nowadays, it's not as expected. If you want that run of published adventure, right? Go pick up Secrets of Salt Marsh or Descent into Avernus or whatever, where someone who's paid professionally to do all that work has done it all, and then go in and twist a few things, right? Well, I mean, you know, they, I I would hate to say don't because there may be aspiring art, art artists out, or art, you know writers out there who really want to get involved in that sort of things. And that's great. Uh, again, you know, so I don't want to. I don't want to say don't do it, but just be again. Be aware. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, Evil John I, saying I enjoy the I enjoy the process of writing, so I tend to go a little heavy on the plot. Again, you just have to make sure you're not writing the story. Right. It's got to be about the characters. It's got to be about the players and what they choose to do. You don't want to be writing fanfic, right? Like, you're you, the story is theirs, not yours. You're there yep. to facilitate. All uh, right. Uh, what else have we got going on in there? I uh, think anything? if we keep up, we're probably just going to get into generic GM tips anymore. <laughs> I think we're moving away from here's All ways right. to become a new DM quicker and become a solid DM. But yeah, play. Actually play. Play at other people's tables. That's big. Play under other DMs. If you can't, watch them. Right? Uh, you can do that nowadays. I, I'm sure on Twitch right now, you could find a million. Don't do it yet. Wait till the show's over. But go to the D and D channel and just scroll through the ridiculous number of people streaming their live stream, their live stream games. You can watch other people play, listen to actual play podcasts, uh, read books on it. They they're out there. A, a surprising number of books, some written extremely well with some great tips you may not have thought of. But do it. Get to the table. Get running games. So that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop segment. If you'd like to read more about gaming and game advice, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on gaming advice now remember if you got a question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com we like to keep growing with the support of fans like you so please take a minute to subscribe follow like rate review click on the bell thumbs up or share with your friends we're looking to grow the brand even more with several things in the works so now's the time to get in on the ground floor sign up to receive tabletop bellhop weekly in your inbox uh, once a week, I send out a email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com blog where you can find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, the holidays are fast approaching. Someone warned me that like, Christmas is in like five weeks. Wow. Uh, make sure we check out our gamer gift guide because gamers are ridiculously hard to shop for. You never know if they are, what games they own, what games they don't own, what games other gamers might have bought them, what expansions they have, what they like. 9,000 games came out. How do you pick which to buy? I've got a bunch of suggestions for gifts that aren't just more games. 
You can find these over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com by clicking on gift guides or get them directly at tabletopbellhop.com slash gifts. Up next, a look at Horrified, the cooperative board game featuring the Universal Studio Monsters. Ah, uh, thanks Ravensburger for sending me a copy of Horrified to review. No other compensation was provided. Horrified was published in late 2019 by Ravensburger, designed by Prospero Hall, which is a name I'm starting to hear more and more often. I think that might, they may be a new up and coming designer or someone that's at least got a few new things coming out. I've seen that name quite a bit. Unfortunately, the artist is not credited anywhere I can find, which I gotta say is a shame because I really dig the art style in this game. I was really disappointed that I didn't get to give a shout out there. Uh, it's a cooperative horror themed game for one to five players with a play time that could run from half an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the player count and the difficulty you choose to play at. Now, talking about the art, I think it's a bold and winning move that they didn't lean on their own film properties. Yes. And instead went with a great original art look. Uh, but let's talk about up first. What did you get in your copy of Horrified? All right. Immediately upon opening the copy of Horrified, you're immediately thrown into immersion here because the first thing you are presented with is a warning. You know, the old school type that was common during the trailers of the classic horror movies. One that warns you that you may not want to continue and it's not for the faint of heart. I'm not going to quote it here, but I just thought this was a fantastic touch and a great way to put the players in the mood and they're in the right mindset. Now, this warning is on the back of the board. And after playing, every time I put the game away, I try to make sure I put that right side up so that someone at an event, if they open this box, is going to see that first. No, it's a little touch. And it's certainly not something that's going to drive up the cost any meaningful way. But it adds a lot to the feel and mood. You know what you're getting into when you crack that box open yeah. and see that on top. Now, the board is threefold and mounted, which is surprising because mounted boards aren't as common nowadays, but it's cool to see. Uh, depicts a town with a bunch of locations connected by roads and so on. Um, this has all your horror movie favorites, right? You've got the camp, the docks, the tower, the museum, the mansion, etc. Uh, there are some water locations, including the Black Lagoon and a couple spots, but those are only actually used if the creature from the Black Lagoon's in the game. Now, I have to say that not only do none of the locations feel extraneous, I also feel like it still has room to grow if they choose to add to it. Yeah, they could easily add on another board or something to the map or throw a sticker on top or expand well, they just, it. I mean, they only just, they even just need, they haven't used all the locations with overlays, so they That's could true. just add a monster with a new overlay, and yeah, there you go. Very easily. Uh, the instructions themselves are clearly written. Nice large text, thank you. Tons of examples, including actual pictures of gameplay components, which is something, for some reason, some people don't do, so it's good to see. I gotta say, this is actually one of the better rule books I've read recently, and this is written well enough. You could sit down, open the box in front of players for the first time, and basically read it out loud to be able to play, and you're gonna be playing in under half an hour. I, I wanna save 10 to 15 minutes, to be honest, but I didn't time myself, but it's definitely quick. Now on the downside, when I tried, the link that is supposed to lead you to a video tutorial for learning only brought me to the sales page for the game. So that was a big fail. Now, is this the same thing as that happened with Minecraft as the game wasn't actually released yet? Because uh, we did get a review copy. No, uh, no. as far as I'm aware, uh, Horrified is actually released. Yeah, it's definitely out there. Okay. Because I know we did, we complained about this during our Minecraft and I didn't realize that Minecraft wasn't released until November uh, last weekend. So it's possible that that's what's happening here. But yeah, at the time, uh, we could not look at the actual, uh, the how to play video. Uh, under the rules, you got your cardboard punch boards. This has a bunch of items, character villager pawns, character boards, other various tokens. Uh, really nice thickness, nice solid thickness. Ridiculously well cut, punched easily. Stuff was literally falling out when I was unboxing it. Uh, the box itself has a cardboard box insert that's not fancy, but it worked well enough to separate the cards from everything else. Now, I can't recall, were there enough baggies in this one, or did you have to reach into your own stock? No, it's this is something new for Ravensburgers, from what I remember. I don't remember them coming with baggies before, but all their newer games have come with baggies. And there were enough baggies that I was trying to decide how to split it up, and I ended up splitting it up so there was a separate baggie for every monster. Now, I think I did have to use the baggie the dice were in for one of the monsters that didn't have a lot of components, but there was more than enough in there to make me happy. Excellent. Now, I did mention dice. The game comes with custom dice. Uh, these are D6s with three, like, explosion burst symbols representing a hit, an exclamation point that represents the monster doing a special action, two of those, and two blank sides. Uh, the monsters themselves are represented by unpainted but colorful miniatures. 
Uh, these are not cool mini or not. These are not hyper detailed resin miniatures. They actually remind me of something that would come out of a plastic tube from a toy store. Uh, like not army men level, but in between. Yeah, well, not highly detailed. There's really no question what they are, unless maybe you're in a hurry when unboxing them live on camera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're going a little too quick, you might miss it. Uh, there's a cloth bag that holds the item tiles when you play, and a large oversized card for each of the monsters. Uh, this is my first complaint. The cardstock on that is a little thinner than I would have liked. It's that terraforming Mars player board thickness that seems to be more and more common. It seems to be a thing. Um, for each of these, there's specific rules for the monster or pair of monsters when you're going to Frankenstein. And on the back, it's got all of the um, the rules for the setup. Now, I was actually just realizing that with that weight uh, for those for that that thin yep. cardstock we hate, and it's the same one they used in Minecraft. Yep. It's photo paper. I don't That's, know. It's 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 basically I I'm, I was just you know handling some earlier today in a printer, and it's the weight of my photo papers basically. So. That seems to be what they've what they've gone with for some reason. So I agree that these monster cards are concerningly thin. Yeah. Uh, you put the ga uh, game away fa too fast once, and you've got a crease you're never going to get rid of. Um, uh, if it, if you're going to get this to the table a lot, I definitely recommend laminating them. Yeah, I I would if you're if you're going to keep if you laminators are one of those things every gamer doesn't know they need until they get one or they have a friend that has one. I I'm probably going to laminate these assuming I keep the game around, which. We'll keep going on about that. Uh, finally, there's a pack of cards. It's actually two decks. One's a monster deck that dictates how the monsters act. And then another is a set of perks, which are things of players that get special abilities. You get them, you can you start with one and you can get them by leveling up during the game by saving villagers. Overall, I was very impressed by the quality and even more so the look. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm bummed that Ravensburg didn't credit the artist here. Maybe they used a team artist. I don't know. They used a studio. I don't know what it is, but the, the look of this game is great. The artwork is fantastic. It's all new, unique hand-drawn artwork for the town, the characters, and all the monsters. Everything is extremely clear to read and easy to see from even across the table. I have a big table. I can see stuff from across. The iconography used is extremely clear. Even the fact that the miniatures is a different color is tied and mechanically important during the game. For example, Dracula's board is red, like that thin board. The monster cards featuring Dracula's actions are red. The chits you put on the board for his coffins are red. All of the Dracula's icons show up in red, and the miniatures red. Now, this is the one minor quibble I had with the game. Some of the strong theme in the game can easily be overlooked because of this color coding. Uh, while red does have a thematic th thread throughout, you end up thinking of them as red items and not, in this case, weapons. So, how does one play Horrified? All right, though it's not really evident from reading the rule book, the main thing you are actually doing in a game of Orified is moving around the town board collecting item tokens from various locations. They come in three colors, as Sean kind of indicated there. Each represents a specific type of tool for battling the monsters. Red tokens are all weapons, blue tokens represent science and study and technology, and yellow tokens represent religion and mysticism. Players are moving around the board trying to grab the right type of tools and use them in the right way while also trying to protect and save innocent villagers. The way tools are used is completely dependent on which monsters are being featured in that game. And this is the neatest part of Horrified, as each monster requires players to collect tools of different types or from different places and use them in unique ways to make the monsters vulnerable and then eventually to drive the monsters away. Now, players win if they're able to drive off the monsters. They lose if the terror level in the town gets too high. The main way this goes up is when a villager or character is defeated by a monster. Players can also lose if they run out of cards in the monster deck. Now, a nice thing to note here, player death is just a setback until that terror level gets too high. Citizens, on the other hand, don't get called back from beyond. Yeah, if a player dies, you just start up the next turn in the hospital. Nice and simple. Now, I get into a lot more detail about the mechanics of the game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com in the full review. Um, I talk about all the different player actions you can take and more, but we've already talked about this game on the show a couple times in the last week, so I'm just going to stick to the short version here. Basically, you're going to get a number of actions based on what character you're playing. One of those actions is unique based on the character. In addition, there's common actions that uh, everyone has, and then special actions based on what monsters. After all the players have used their actions, or after each player, sorry, after a player has done their actions for the turn, the monsters activate, and that's based on that monster deck. Monsters' attacks are using the special dice, 
Players can defend themselves by discarding items. Villagers, though, unless they're defended by a character, are taken out in one hit. Uh, so, did you want to comment on the turn length problem you had with this game? I'd, I still am not happy about that. One of the things in the game is every character has a different number of actions. One of the characters only has three, one has five, the average is four. And I just don't like the fact that different players are going to have longer or shorter turns based on what character they got randomly. It just seems odd to me that someone will get to play the game more than someone else. Now, it's done to compensate for the player powers. The person who only has three actions can move anywhere on the board with one action. So they don't have to spend turns moving. So I get it. And the player who has five has no special ability, so they get five actions. And I get that as a balance issue, but I don't like the fact that sitting at the table, if Deanna, me, and Sean are playing, Sean may get to play the game more than I do because his character has more actions on it. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I disagree. And I know, I believe Deanna, who played the the three, three action character uh, that first play, didn't necessarily agree. But it's definitely a valid, I think it's definitely yeah. a valid uh, concern. Uh, now, one thing I just want to point out, uh, as we're here, Prospero Hall is a team. Uh, so it is actually a design okay. studio. And the reason that they aren't accrediting the artist is they are internal to the Prospero Hall team. Oh, there we go. Okay. And that's probably why I'm seeing the name show up more and more, because they're probably a development team that's been used multiple times. Uh, yeah. And so they're, they, they're on uh, Villainous and the yep. Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, for instance. That's the one I think I saw them on. All right, so actually beating monsters is completely unique. How you do this is unique. Every monster is going to require you to collect tools. That's what you do in this game. You move around and collect tools. It's what you do with them that changes. For example, the Invisible Man, you need to collect items from specific locations around the map and then bring them to the police precinct. Now, thematically, this represents gathering evidence of the Invisible Man's existence. Once you have enough evidence, you help the police capture the monster. Now, when you're capturing the monster, though, you're going to need red tools which represent weapons to be able to defeat him. Now, every monster's like that. Well, it, you need to do one thing to make them vulnerable and then another thing to defeat them, and it's usually different combinations of tools. Now, what this means is playing against every monster makes the game feel different. And again, really deeply linked thematic ideas, but they can also be simplified, for better or worse, and you need to go get this color with this number. Now, I first broke out horrified at our extra late charity gaming event. I actually punched the game, read the instructions for the first time at the event just before playing. That is how quick this game can be to get to the table and how great the instructions are for helping you get it to the table quickly. Yeah, now my first play was just a couple of days later uh, and I had flipped through the rule book in advance, but just from doing that, I felt pretty confident and uh, we jumped right in. Now, that first game was with uh, four players, and we had the two suggested starting monsters. That went really well. Now, since then, I played in a number of different player counts with different sets of monsters and different monster counts. Now, at this point, one of the things I will say is that the two-monster game is going to be too easy for most groups. Sure, use it when first teaching the game, but move on to three as soon as possible. Now, I gotta say, four monsters seem pretty much impossible at this point, but it is something I'm planning to try to win someday. I do uh, completely agree about two monsters. They indicate it, it's a starting point, and that's really all it is. It's how you teach the game or even learn the game and then never use monsters, yeah. two monsters again, even if you're teaching it to other people because mm -hmm. it might drive you crazy as someone who's familiar with the game. That's true. And I'll get to that when we get to our week in review. Now, what I really love about Horrified is how the overall feel of the game changes based on what monsters you face. The designer did a, or design team, I guess, did a fantastic job of making each monster unique. I really dig how the theme is integrated. Yes, you're just collecting red, yellow, and blue chips, but it makes sense that you would need weapons to fight off Dracula's Misnians, the first part of his quest, and then mystic items to drive him home. And even the names of the items are actually tied to where you get them. For example, the torches and pitchforks are easy to pick up at the barn, but the only place you're going to find a pistol is the police precinct. Now, I've only had it on the table twice, but I agree the monsters behave differently and the aspects of the game you're focusing on are quite different with each arrangement, especially when it comes to things like forgetting the creature moves through water so <laughs> it has shorter paths, or the Frankenstein monsters not meeting is more important than just about anything else. Yeah. Now, the cooperative aspect of Horrified leads me to its biggest potential problem I can see with some gaming groups. 
This is a cooperative game where all information is open and every turn, every player can see all of the options open to every other player. And that leads itself to quarterbacking. A player with dominant personality can take over the group or end up playing the game for one or more players. Now, this isn't a problem unique to Horrified. It's very common in other cooperative games like Pandemic, but it's something I want people to be aware of before buying this game. Yeah, the three of us, um, Mo, D, and myself, are all pretty strong gamers, and it was immediately obvious that had it not been the case, it would have been all too easy to sit back and ride along in the wake of the others. Yeah. One, on the plus side, the fact that we were all so involved really says something positive about the game. Overall, I gotta say, I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. I've had a great time playing this game every time it's hit the table. I love the asymmetric nature of the game and the way it changes, both how the game feels and how it plays, depending on what monsters are in play. While it might seem easy only facing two universal monsters, the real tension in the front of the game comes out when you face three or probably four, though there's no way you're going to win. If you beat it on four, let us know. For a more in-depth look at Horrified, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year, what games hit our tables. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and cool gaming stuff that's been going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, so first up, Friday night, I tried something new. I played Gloomhaven by myself. Corey and Kat were busy with a family obligation, and Deanna wasn't feeling 100%, so I sat down and played the Saw class solo mission. I don't want to spoil anything here. Don't worry. Uh, it was a very interesting mission, uh, very much a puzzle, which was something different. Uh, the actual play video for that game will be going live tomorrow, so check that out on YouTube and see how I did. And this is actually one of our quicker Gloomhaven segments, so it's a nice, easy uh, watch for you. <laughs> That's true. It, it was over quickly, for better or for worse. <laughs> now, this past weekend, we hosted our first Sunday event at Easy Mode Esports Lounge here in Windsor. Uh, they had something going on with the University of Windsor on Saturday, so we decided to try for a Sunday afternoon event. And I'm pleased to say it went rather well. Now, what I liked about Sunday's event was the number of new people we saw. Out. Now, this is something you can expect when you try a different day of the week for a regular from a regular event. And something I recommend, if you do host a regular event and it's always on Saturdays, try mixing it up now and then just to try to get some new people out. But this was more new people than I was expecting and less regulars, which it was it was shocking the number of new people I saw. It's one of those where every now and then I wonder, I'm like, man, I thought I met all the gamers in Windsor. Well, the huge benefit benefit of these events at Easy Mode has been the new gamers and yeah. some who are very new. Some of these are people who are still at the Monopoly stage of gaming, being introduced to the world of hobby games. Yeah, and we did have some people out like that this week. Uh, not only was it great to see new people out, what was cool was some of these new people even brought games with them. Like there was one Jesse or James, I'm forgetting which. I'm not trying to do a Team Rocket here. It was a J name. I'm sorry, I should have looked it up, put it in the show notes. Um, who was very enthusiastic about bringing games out to public events and getting game people out playing. and was very excited to have brought a small collection of games to the event. Uh, there was another couple who also brought a bag full of games. It was great to see other people willing to share their gaming collections and teach games. Sorry, Josh, I apologize. I was off on both counts. It was a J name. I at least got that right. Thank you, Josh, for bringing games. Plus, I got to say, for me, it's always awesome to see because I'm the game teacher in the group, and it's nice to see other people who are willing to teach games and bring their own games out so that I can be freed up to usually hit up the Monopoly gamers and try to get them to play something more interesting. Well, it's always nice when there's more people available to teach. It is one of the most scarce resources this days in, these days in gaming, solid teachers. Now, Sunday's event was a little shorter than our usual night. Deanna and I had plans on the afternoon uh, involving the kids, so we only got in two games. Now, the first was a five-player game of Horrified. Uh, for this, I did, as we just talked about in the review section, and jumped right to the three monsters, despite the fact four of the five players were brand new to the game. Uh, we faced off against Dracula, the Invisible Man, and Frankenstein and his Bride. Now, for, the, for those who don't know the game, Frankenstein and his Bride do actually count as one monster, but uh, I'm interested to hear how it went, because I wouldn't have chosen Frankenstein as monster for new gamers. Uh, we didn't pick. We went, we went completely random. So oh, okay. th these weren't chosen monsters. We shuffled them up and, and picked. So uh, this was a very tense and exciting game of Horrified. We literally were down to the last 
card and one die roll between winning and losing the game. Uh, we managed to take out the Invisible Man first. Then we humanized both Frankie and his bride, who only met together once. And then it was down to Dracula. And we literally hadn't touched Dracula at that point. We just ignored Dracula at this whole time. Uh, we managed to destroy all the coffins. And all we needed was to get someone to move next to him and spend enough mystic items to win, to discard three. The problem was Dracula activated first, moved on to that character's spot who had the three items required to defeat him. But he had one extra item on him, one blue item still on him. Had Dracula gotten two hits on the character, it would have been over. We would have run out of time. Luckily, with the three dice count, only one roll to hit, we had the three yellow items and we managed to win in the literally last round. If the turn had ended, we would have lost. Well, it's good to know it's doable. Now, did you find that the larger player count helped with more minds to look at potential so uh, solutions and more areas to spread out onto on the board? Well, I have to say five players, I, I think it's going to depend on the monsters. Five players with the Invisible Man seemed very easy because the Invisible Man was go to various different, I think it's six different locations of the yep. board, grab an item and bring it back. So two things really helped with that. One, the fact we had five people doing it. With five people, we had five clerks, which included two taxis, which let you move everywhere. Right. Plus, I was playing the character that could teleport, the one with only three actions. So I could basically every turn move to one of them and then... Uh, like, and then next turn, bring it in. Like it was right. it, like all of that combined. Well, what I did find interesting in this game that I hadn't seen in previous games is we did a lot more trading of items, which I hadn't seen before. So this group worked more together that way. So we had the character that could pick up items from nearby. And what they basically did is they, they played, um, I'm trying to think of the wrong word, bellhop basically. Like they, they collected stuff and then we would move to their spot and disseminate right. the items to different people and be like, here, you take these yellow items, you go smash a coffin, you go do this. So that was interesting to see. Yeah, I know D and I had done a little bit of that in our two player game, uh, but very, very minor. It was just one of those, if we happened to be passing by the right area at the right yeah. time, we'd do a trade off. The other one too, is we use the mayor to save all the people. The mayor's ability is move other people. Okay. And all they did, I think for the entire game was move villagers. Right. So that was a, it was a very different, like everyone, everyone seemed to really play at their skills. Now we had two new gamers in that group. I don't know if I call them monopoly level gamers, but like they've been out to a couple brimstone events in the past, but they definitely not hobby board gamers. Like they're new right. to it. So that was interesting. And that, what was cool about that is it was a couple who showed up to easy mode with their kid so their kid could play switch. And then they were going to go work out, but there was this board game thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> so they got a good workout fighting universal monsters. There we go. Uh, now D mentions it wasn't a quick game. Was it, uh, what was the playtime like? I, uh, I'm gonna guess an hour, hour and a half. I, oh, I didn't that's not bad then. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't horribly long. I know they did finish at least two games of Splendor before we got to play. Right. Someone had finished a game of Ticket to Ride. I we still had enough to play another game, and it was only a four hour event. No, because we ran over on that. It must have been closer to an hour and a half. Okay, it's still not too bad though. I mean, I I, I think that you know for that game, it's a worthy. I I, I enjoy that game, so <laughs> it doesn't seem like a long time. Now, the other game I mentioned that uh, I played two games. The other one was my first full game of Pulsar 2849. Uh, this is a game Deanna and I first played at Origins a couple of years back. Um, that time we only did a short 45-minute demo, and it was enough to know, wow, we like this game. This is really cool. So when I went back to Origins this year, I basically begged Check Games Edition to give me a review copy, which took a lot of work and meeting multiple people. But they eventually relented on Saturday. Saturday. Ugh. Sunday night at Origins. So thank you, CGE, for that. Uh, I finally got to try that review copy Sunday. Uh, this was a four-player, very much learning game where I kind of taught the rules and told everyone just have fun, just explore, because uh, it's it can be rough. Now, I also broke out the game on Monday night from my Monday night home game. This was another four-player game with two of us knowing the rules, and I had played once before, and that went a lot better because I had now played the game so I could teach it better and I could tell people what to focus on. Yeah, I watched the unboxing, but uh, up until I just opened the Board Game Geek page, I know nothing yeah. about this game. So Yeah, it's a, there's some buzz for this when it came out. It's not new. I don't you know the year because you just looked it up on Board Game <laughs> Geek. It, it definitely wasn't new last year or anything like that. No, it's a 2017. Yeah, so this isn't this isn't the new hot. Now, we're back to our usual schedule of <laughs> focusing on games from years ago that I'm now playing for the first time and loving. Uh, this is a pretty heavy 
sci-fi euro. I like it's not up there with the Veen hosts out there, but like you know, it's it's top in terraforming Mars, I'm sure. It's a three. Uh, it's all about exploring the area around a newly discovered black hole in the year 2849. Um, it's based on theme. It's sci-fi, but there's no reason it had to be sci-fi, but it works. Uh, this is very much a dice-driven point salad where players are drafting dice, then using those dice to take actions based on the pips that are on the dice. The actions include moving your ship around the board, and in doing that, you're going to explore and settle solar systems and claim pulsars. Once you've got a pulsar claimed, you can build a gyrodyne around it by spending a die. You can then spin up your gyrodynes that are already out there. Those are a big part of scoring because gyrodynes will start generating points every round. Now, thematically, you're sending energy back to Earth or something. I don't know. I spun up gyrodynes. I got points. Uh, you can also build transmitters, which I think are the ones that are transmitting the energy back. But again, theme, who cares? You build these transmitters. Uh, and then there's a whole tech tree that releases new techs every year into the game and you play eight years and you can patent technologies. And then because it's a dice game and it's a heavy euro, there is a way to buy dice modifiers so that you can mitigate die rolls. Uh, there's a plus minus one and a plus two modifier. Now there's also some asymmetric player boards that have something to do with developing your home base and your own home projects. But those weren't recommended to be used in the first game. And to be honest, I literally skipped that section of the rulebook. I haven't even read how to use them. We had new people playing both games, so I just left them in the box so far. Now, there is a lot going on in Pulsar. Every turn, players have a wealth of options and things to think about, especially you were rolling nine dice. So the odds of getting, it's just D6s. One to six showing up every turn are pretty high. So pretty much every option is going to be available to you, especially if you're the first person to draft dice. There's a lot to think about. Then that can cause a lot of AP. Then there's the problem of once you've actually picked your dice and you're doing your actions, a lot of the stuff's limited. There's only so many systems out there. Each system only has so many worlds that can be landed on it. There's only so many pulsars. And for the tech tree in particular, there's only two of each technology. And we're playing four players. So that means only half the players can possibly get each technology. So one of the things that happens a lot in this game is someone takes your spot, right? You plan out your turn. You take forever. You finally figure out which two dice you have. You've got your turn ready to go. You go to do it in the player before you does the thing you want to do. And now you got to replan your plan right from the start. Now, this can be frustrating, but I think that's actually a feature of the game. That's part of what gives this game its weight. So this definitely sounds like a heavier, one of the heavier sci-fi games yeah. around. You're looking at much more of a Stefan Feld than a Cody yeah. Miller. Yeah, um, I wouldn't have been surprised if this said Stefan Feld on the cover. It doesn't. It's um, yeah. Vladimir Suchi, I think, yeah. is the name of the designer. Yeah. I, I I'm going to guess the pronunciation of, my... of that of that last yeah. name. It, but I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that's how I've heard it pronounced before. All right. Uh, that was pretty so, good. I, did, I don't even have that in the notes. It's a, it's a 3.31, so it puts it a little bit lighter than Brass Birmingham, but not by much. Yeah, but it's up there with brass and heavy yeah, economic yeah. Yeah, games, it's right? right? In there. This is no race for the galaxy, roll for the galaxy. Yeah, or Zaya. <laughs> right? Uh, this this yeah. is this is but it's also no Venhost, right? Yep. Um no, it's it's solid. I I am really digging it. Uh I'll admit Deanna's loving it even more than I am. She she I I like heavy games, she loves heavy games. Uh this is the kind of meaty euro that we both enjoy. I am really looking forward to playing it more in the coming weeks and especially checking out those asymmetric home base rolls. Now, one caveat, Sean from Hamilton, not Sean Hamilton. Nope, the other way around. Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. I think that's the first time I messed that up. <laughs> Played it and did have a complaint about the game that I, I think is valid, though I didn't feel it. He found it wasn't rewarding, which we talked about it a bit after the game, because like when you play Terraforming Mars at the end, even if you lost, you built something. Like you built an engine, you've done a thing, you have all your cards in front of you. Where at the end of this, you have a score. He, right. he didn't really feel like he had he had it was it wasn't a rewarding experience for him. He said, "Now, had he won, he might have felt different, but it just seemed like you were doing a bunch of things for points instead of developing something, building an engine, or feeling like your strategy has been rewarded." Now, again, this was his first play, so maybe not kind of just fumbling around and doing things to get points got to that point. So that is one complaint I have had about the game. Now, Deanna and I don't I don't feel that way about it. I'll admit, yeah, I didn't really feel like I built something, but I still had fun doing whatever it was we did to score whatever points we did. Yeah, I mean, this this is a Euro, a very, you know, pure Euro almost. Yeah. So to to see that sort of um, feeling of, of what Sean saw as incompleteness isn't really surprising. Uh, I think that's just sort of something that, uh, you know, it's not necessarily Sean's cup of tea 
yeah. uh, as much as, as, you know, having that accomplishment in front of you for mm -hmm. something, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, all right. So how about a look ahead? What have you got planned coming into the table next week? All right, for those of you live, if you head down to the CG Realm on Saturday, the 23rd, I am going to be teaching Cthulhu Death May Die. We're going to break that one out. I think we'll bring out He Who Should Not Be Named. I think I may try the fire scenario one more time just to get used to the rules and then maybe try something else. Um, couple Then after that, we got two weeks in a row with no local gaming events. So it's uh, the usual... We have a month with five Saturdays, so we don't do anything on the fifth Saturday of the month, and I don't host a game night on the first Saturday of the month. So we do have a couple weeks off, but Black Friday and Cyber Monday are coming, which is huge for Deanna and I. A lot of um, our income comes from affiliate sales, and we are going to be very busy sharing deals through tabletop underscore deals, our tabletop gaming deals page on the blog. So head over to Tabletop Bellhop, click on... I think it says gaming deals. Now I can't even remember because I look at it every day and I think it says gaming deals. Uh, click on that or a newly launched Maple Game Deals on Twitter. Mm. Tabletop Game Deals. That is the, the, the link on our webpage. We will be trying to get all of the best tabletop gaming deals out there for Black Friday. Hopefully, yeah. we'll get some gaming in, too, but we'll see. And now, a quick shout-out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Jeff Seuss, thanks. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thanks for joining us yet again this week. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to the end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.